Welcome, welcome, sisters. This is Dawn Del Vecchio from DawnDelVecchio.com, Priestess School, and the Empowered Feminine Leadership Retreats. I thank you for being here, and this training is called The Legacy of His Story. And this is part of the foundational training to prepare you for the retreat. And in this, this training, I am going to be talking about some of the more difficult aspects of probably the, the, what we could say is, is the heaviest, most um, difficult stuff to listen to for, for all of our training. But I feel it's extremely important to set this foundation, not because we want to rage against what had been, but so that we as as women, as women reclaiming the sacred, as priestesses, as powerful shamans, witches, medicine women, and healers, so that we can transmute these old energies, not just for our personal selves, but for our lineages and for the collective. And also, I would say, for, for our incarnational selves. So I want to begin by talking about uh, differentiating, talking about a few things here. First, I want to talk about this concept of dominator culture. And I've already talked about this before in another training in the, um, in the um, uh, Reclaiming Sacred Feminine, I believe. So I use the term dominator culture to refer to the culture that we are currently living in. Now, dominator culture is kind of an overall term that just suggests that uh, the culture is founded in principles based on domination. Now, within the dominator culture we have been living in, we are living in what we would call a patriarchal dominator culture. So domination by the masculine, the patriarch over the feminine, the matri matriarch or, or matri, which is feminine, mater, mother. And within a dominator culture that is based in patriarchy, what we have found over a long stretch of time 6,000-ish years, is that there's been an increasing uh, perpetration of uh, the abuse of the feminine, the denigration of the feminine and the abuse of the feminine and the usurpation of all feminine power such that women were left with a kind of collective PTSD and such disempowerment that we could be completely controlled, abused, raped, pillaged, etc. So the, the idea for this training is to really to touch on some key points in history that uh, I feel are really important to understand, to, to really understand, like, how did this happen? How did this happen? And so that's what I'm going to start to share now. Excuse me, I want to take a sip of my water here. So first I want to ask you all to take a deep breath. Just give yourself permission to drop in now, taking a breath into the chest, into the heart space, expanding and filling yourself with air. And as you exhale, releasing anything that is keeping you distracted or in your head. This material is better received from the space of the heart, the space of presence, so now I want to invite you to place your hands on your womb space and now breathe in to the heart again. And as you exhale, drop into the womb space, allowing yourself to be fully present here in the emptiness, stillness, the black void of no thingness. Breathing in, up into the heart space, and exhaling, dropping down into the womb space, just relaxing there for a moment. And then breathing normally. This sacred womb space, this void cauldron of becoming, is the very essence of the feminine. It is the dark unknown. It is the vessel and container from which all things are seated, gestated, and birthed, and to which all returns. There is something 
deeply comforting when we give ourselves permission to rest in the void space of the feminine. And when we are deeply polarized in the left brain, rational, masculine mind, there is something deeply terrifying about this space as well. And so as we go through this training, I want to invite you to really stay connected with your breath. And when things arise for you, the information that arises, if it's triggering for you or distressful, I want you to breathe into the heart and exhale into the womb space and let yourself rest in your own cauldron, your own womb space and begin to invite the possibility that this is the safest place for you. And be sure to keep your breath going. You could pause in the in, at the top of the breath and the bottom, but be sure to keep breathing even and especially if something is triggering. So I want to begin with talking about the concept of internalizing the values of the oppressor. This is a phrase I learned when I studied black studies and black, um, uh, black women, femi women, black feminine, what was it called? Um, black women feminist studies and also the black power movement in the 60s. So I've done some undergrad and graduate studies in those areas. And this is a term that was once used to apply to slaves who began to internalize the values of their white slave owners, whether that was uh, wanting their children to be a lighter color or being the, um, um, what do you call it, the, um, the person who would enforce, being the enforcer of the slave owner's will against other slaves internalizing the values of the oppressor. And feminists uh, who were studying uh, these things began to apply that, or at least I have, you know what, I don't even know if anyone else did, but I'm pretty sure some of my professors did, apply this concept to the way women have internalized the values of patriarchy and uh, the domination or the oppression of the masculine over the feminine, the way we have internalized these values and lived them out and perpetrated them on our daughters and granddaughters. So I'm going to talk about three different areas where we have seen this historically and how that has contributed in a very, very powerful way to ensuring that the feminine, the females, not not only don't have power, but is completely denigrated. And the way women have also often um, participated in this and in fact often been the primary enforcers. So I'm going to begin with a practice that comes from China a long time ago. Um, maybe I want to say, you know what, I'm going to have to find the dates for that. But uh, there was a practice for a very long time in China called Chinese foot binding. And this comes apparently, to the best of our knowledge, there was an emperor at one point who fancied small feet on women. He found them beautiful and arousing. And, um, and so he picked concubines with the smallest feet. And as is often the case in hierarchical cultures where a very, very small number of people are the, the, you know, the rulers at the very top and then it's pyramidal in nature and so then the, you know, the next level and the next level of elite echelons, are, you know, they become like the highest right next to the king. There's a small group and then there's a bit of a bigger group below that and a bigger group below that, etc. So as is often the case is those higher ups, they want to be like the top top. And so they emulate the king or the emperor or whatever. And so what started to happen, what became fashionable in the high culture, you know, the highest echelons of culture of China, is um, people began breaking their daughter's feet in half, and binding them, folding them in half so that, if you can imagine for a moment, if you're standing on your, on your feet, you pick up one foot and you take your toes and you try and bend them all the way back so they touch the heel. Not possible, right? Not even remotely possible. Well, as little, little babies, they would start to bind their feet. 
the mothers, the grandmothers, yes, the women, not the men, the mothers or the grandmothers, aunties, started binding their feet. So uh, in time, the bones would break, uh, you know, or, and, and sort of, you know, regrow in this fractured half, you know, broken in half way. And um, what we understand is that you can imagine that this was incredibly painful. But apparently one of the most painful things was uh, when the feet would be unbound to be cleaned periodically. Because you can imagine the toenails would start growing into either the heel of the foot or the, you know, the, the arch of the foot. And so periodically the feet would have to be unbound and cleaned and there was infections and putrid pus and it was nasty. I mean really, truly nasty. And women's feet were broken. They were unable to stand on their own two feet. And this is what made them eligible to be married off to higher echelon men. And this is but one aspect of Chinese culture that is absolutely misogynistic, which means woman-hating and um, torturous to women. You know, we know that the vast majority of infanticide or the murdering of children, not just in China but elsewhere, is the daughters. This is true in India as well, or has been true historically. I don't know about now, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's still the case. So um, this, this torture of the feminine in order to make them sexually appealing to men is, um, this is one example uh, of the, Ch the Chinese foot binding is one example. And again, men didn't do this to women. Women did this to women. The mothers, the grandmothers, the aunties. So Chinese foot, foot binding is long since gone out of practice, uh, but it really did, I'm sure, do something to women's ability to stand on her own two feet. And so that's just one example, and we're just going to shelve that for a moment and shift now from China to the Middle East and to Africa where there are a number of countries where to this day still there is a practice that is implemented to all pubescent girls called clitoridectomy. And clitoridectomy is when the clitoris is cut off of the girl right at her, usually at her puberty. And again, this is not done by men. This is a ceremonial rite of passage in which the aunties, the mothers, the grandmothers hold the girl down and depending on how poor the villages are, sometimes with a piece of broken coke bottle, brutally slice off the, the clitoris of the girl. And I just want to, for a minute, just touch on the whole, what, what this implies, what the clitoris is and does. In all mammal species, all mammal species, only the female human possesses this thing called the clitoris, whose function is, 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 is it, it has one function and one function only, to give pleasure to the woman. There are about 8,000 nerves that end and meet at the very tip of the clitoris. And not only do those nerves spread out all around the pelvic area of the woman, but they go to other parts of her body as well. So clitoridectomy does one thing and one thing only. Well, it does a few things. Sometimes it creates horrible infection as well and kills girls. Um, it, 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 its design is to stop female sexual pleasure so that women will not have sexual desire so that she will be marriageable, so that men can be sure they can control their wife and that their children are theirs, etc., etc. So again, here is another example of, of um, the brutal abuse of the feminine under a patriarchal dominator culture. And again, perpetrated by women against other women, against the young, young ones. So these are two examples, one from the Far East, one from the Middle East. And 
What I want to talk about now is this concept of the mother wound and the sister wound. Because if we as women have internalized the values of the oppressor, in other words, the values of patriarchal culture, that means that we value the masculine over the feminine. And if we live in a dominator culture that isn't just saying, well, you know, the masculine's a little better than the feminine, but actually permits values and, and, and um, perpetrates brutality against the feminine, uh, glorifies rape culture, correlates anything feminine with something that's dirty, nasty, or worthy of disdain. If we have internalized those, then this is, at some core level, how we relate to our feminine selves. Now, many of us have done a lot of work, and I get it. Many of you who listen to this, you, don't, you won't feel this so much. But we must understand that as a planetary culture, the vast majority of women are still living in this kind of paradigm. And those who are living in cultures that perpetrate violence against women as part of their rites of passage or cultural quote-unquote normalcy, what we see is this women perpetrating it on their younger female siblings and family members in order to make them appealing enough for men. And this creates such a profound wound among women that it's almost unfathomable. Is it any wonder that there are so many women who are so struggling to love and accept themselves? Is it any wonder how many um, narcissistic mothers are coming to the surface and we're seeing just how traumatizing that is to their daughters? to say nothing of the sons. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. That's a different conversation. So this, this is profound. It's, it's a profound um, I, 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 I want to say, I'm not sure if it's the word truncation or like severing or, or it, it's a wound. Let's just say it's a wound uh, in the relationships among women and in the female lineage that daughters can't trust their mothers and mothers can't trust their daughters unless they manipulate them and sometimes abuse them to make sure they conform to the norms of the dominator culture, the dominant culture. So there's another area I want to talk about now, which is the, the uh, European, the European area. So we've touched a little bit on the Far East, we've talked a little, just a little bit about the Middle East, some of the traditions in Africa and the Middle East. Now I want to talk about an area that I studied in particular when I was uh, back in my feminist study years and my early goddess study years. And this is a period of time called the Inquisition. And the Inquisition is a period of time, it's also called the witch burnings or the witch craze. It's a period of time that lasted between 250 and 300 years and estimates run that between 500,000 and 9 million people were killed over approximately a 250 to 300 year period, year period of time. In, this happened primarily in Europe and also uh, there was a little coda at the very end of that in the New World in America. So you may have heard of the Salem Witch Trials. That's very famous. The Salem Witch Trials were a teeny weeny weeny example of what really went on in Europe during the very late Dark Ages and primarily the Renaissance period of time in Europe. And um, in some areas of Europe, entire villages were wiped out during the period of what is known as the Inquisition. Many children were also murdered. However, one thing that's very important to understand is that 70% of those who were killed as witches were, throughout Europe were women. And both Catholics and Protestants accepted, that, both Catholics, Catholics and Protestants um, participated in this. So some people think this was just the Catholic Church. So 
Sometimes people get a little bit of information about the Inquisition. They go, oh, it wasn't just the Salem witch trials. It was actually um, the in Europe. So some of the mis misunderstandings are, oh, well, but it was the, those dark ages, you know, those medieval dark ages. Those people, they were so lost, you know, after the fall of the Roman Empire, of course. But then we had this, the Renaissance, the reflowering, the Reformation. This is when we all awoke into our greater wisdom. No, this was the height of the witch-burning craze, was that early Renaissance. Same period of time. So, um, because history is written by the winners, and his story in particular, as we were talking about today, has been written by the winners, his story is that the Renaissance was the reflowering. It was the reblossoming of consciousness after all those years, more than a thousand years of the Dark Ages. But the truth is that that this witch burning, oh, this little, you know, there was this little witch craze thing that went on, but, you know, it wasn't a big deal. No, it was everywhere in Europe. And it was horrible, and it was the woman's holocaust. I want to say that again. The Inquisition period in Europe, the witch craze, you could also call it, was the women's holocaust. And whether you are an Asian woman, a Middle Eastern woman, a South American woman, an African woman, knowing and understanding that we have all lived in multiple incarnations. And also knowing and understanding that the Western world's values have been the thing that have mostly dominated the rest of the world. I think that it's fair to say that that Holocaust against women has implications for all of us today. All of us. And is it any wonder I would say, given that many of us have multiple incarnations and many of us likely lived and experienced this period of time ourselves in some other incarnation, is it any wonder that there are so many healers, helpers, transformational leaders in the making, wise women, priestesses, who when actually faced with shining their light, stepping up in a bigger way, feel some inexplicable terror that seems almost impossible to break through. I would argue that this is often because somewhere in our incarnational field, in our soul, let's say, our soul's memory, we remember what it was like to be tortured and killed, often burned at the stake, sometimes drowned, uh, as a witch during this time. So um, I, I want to put that aside for a moment and kind of, I'm getting ahead of myself here, so let me back up here. I want to give you a little bit of the actual history, a little bit of the facts. So let's look at some of the facts here. Okay, so as I said, we're looking at anywhere between a, a half a million and nine million killed over a 300 year period approximately throughout Europe. 70% were women and Torture was protocol. So this wasn't just like, hey, you're being accused of a witch, go to trial, and we're going to talk about what the trial, quote-unquote, looked like later, a little bit later in this. And, uh, oh, you're a witch, we're going to hang you, or we're going to fine you, or whatever. No, torture was protocol. It was, as the French scholars would say, de rigueur. It was a part of the phenomena of being accused as a witch. But again, I'm a little bit getting ahead of myself. Let me give you the history here. So, 1484, there was a pope, and his name, and you can't make this shit up, was Pope Innocent VIII, who, Pope, good old Pope Innocent, was probably responsible for more torturous deaths of women than any individual human possibly ever. I don't know what the numbers of the Holocaust, uh, the the... Jewish Holocaust in Europe was, but the women's Holocaust certainly in this time was just, I mean, thank you, Pope Innocent. So, 1484, Pope Innocent VIII issued a papal bull, which is a document, basically, a religious document, that condemned witchcraft. He then authorized these two German guys named Jacob Sprenger and Heinrich Kramer to combat the problem. Now, 
Kramer and Springer went about creating a, a book called the Malleus Malificar Maleficarum, which translates from the Latin to the hammer against witches. And thanks to the advent of the printing press, there were two books that were initially mass produced so that people who could read Latin, in other words, the church elders all over Europe could read this. One was the Bible and the other was, you guessed it, the Malleus Maleficarum, the hammer against witches. And so uh, from the late 15th century, which is the 1400s, through the early 18th century, which is the 1700s, this period of time called the Inquisition took place. And again, this is often called also the witch craze. This was the period of time when a number of interesting things happened. I mean, it wasn't interesting for the women and few men and children who were burned, uh, but um, a couple of things that are important to, to note here. That, first of all, the devil was invented at this time. You know, Satan, you know, that half goat, half man, kind of red, got the horns, pitchfork, that sort of thing. Well, he didn't exist in old U European traditional culture. But there was a god of the earth named Pan, sometimes called Kernunos, the horned god, who would mate with the earth mother in order to activate fertility. But he was not a devil. He was not one who tempted souls to evil and had some equal power to God. That was a creation of the church, and that specifically from the Catholic Church. And it was this devil who was supposed to cavort with witches. So the old term witch comes from the word wick, which means to bend or shape. And many, many people, myself included, have been using the word witch as a way of reclaiming something that had been used against us, the hammer against witches, long ago. To say, you know what, the witches, we were not cavorting with evil. We were the wise ones. We were the shamans. We were the healers, the herbalists, the medicine women. We were the midwives who not only helped children come onto this planet and held the wisdom and the knowledge of how to help mothers do that. We were the ones who midwife the dead, midwife the dying to help them with their transition back. We were the ones with the power in the communities. When shit went down with people's health, they came to us. They did not go to the church elders. And they did not go to the men who were fiddling around with um, human bodies in an attempt to become doctors. In other words, the early, early male medical establishment. So when things went down, and so, so what was happening was that the church over the course of the Middle Ages was getting stronger and stronger in their control of the masses. And they did a, quite a good job. Uh, but there were still people practicing the old ways. They were still doing their sacred enactments and they wouldn't get rid of Mary. They wouldn't get rid of a divine mother. That's why there's so many churches like Chartres Cathedral in France that are dedicated to Mother Mary because they could not take the goddess away from the people. But they sure as hell tried. And so this period of time, the Inquisition, there were two things going on here that most people don't understand. They see, okay, the Catholic Church was trying to do its final seize of control of the masses and terrorizing everyone into showing up at church, uh, giving their money to the church, and being obedient to the church. That was, that was definitely one part of it. The other part of it was there was this early, you know, the early bit of this male medical establishment rising. And these men, they wanted, they wanted control over that. They wanted the money. They wanted, if you were going to have a baby, they wanted you to go to them, not to the midwife. This is where you get this idea of old wives' tales. Uh, so there was, a, there was a sort of secondary agenda going on of taking power away from the feminine wise ones in the villages and the hamlets and the communities. And a, a little side note here, and then we're going to go on. There's a, there's a little bit more I want to share here before I wrap this up. But one side note is that as this budding male medical establishment began to really 
um, get traction and have power. What happened was they, because they called everything that the midwives knew old wives' tales, they didn't listen to any of that, and they were fairly ignorant on basic, basic hygiene principles. So they would handle the sick, the dead, and the dying, and they would walk right over to help a woman give birth. I say help very loosely there because forceps and other interventions. And so what happened is when the midwives who knew about hygiene and knew about herbs that stopped the bleeding or d did different kinds of necessary things during childbirth, uh, when, when the men started doing this and the midwives no longer could do it, the rise, the spike in maternal and neonatal deaths was breathtaking, actually breathtaking. Uh, because again, you know, these, these, these male medical wannabe doctors, because they didn't have medicine like they have now, had death on their very hands and would go into the birthing space. So you could imagine, you know, what, what was involved there and, and how difficult it would have been. And they were ignorant to some of the important things that midwives knew about how to handle a woman in labor. Because remember, they're already, by the time the male medical establishment is rising, we are, they're already well indoctrinated into a couple thousand, couple hundred years, thousand years of woman hating and denigration of the feminine, maybe more than that. Yeah, more than that, a couple thousand years at least. So the dismissal of the knowingness of the mothers, the dismissal of the knowingness of the midwives, and the interventions of invention by the masculine caused, a, like I said, a real spike in the death rates. So that's a little bit of an aside, but I want to kind of get back here to this whole um, thing about the witch burning. So I want to, again, invite you to take a breath here. Take a breath. Make sure you stay connected with that because I want to look now and share with you a little bit about the nature of what it was to experience living in that period of time. As I've said, I call this the Women's Holocaust. And not only was it was, uh, was the Women's Holocaust, this was sort of the death blow to sisterhood. Because once accused of being a witch, you would be tortured until you started naming names. Such that, as I said, sometimes whole villages were completely wiped out. So you could imagine how unsafe it would be to associate with anyone. And to have close sister relationships could be not just your, your death, um, you know, your death ticket, but your torture ticket. And I think there's an important thing to say here, which is, again, why I invite you to breathe for a moment. Because so I want to read this part to you, and I want to, again, emphasize that I give you, share this information, not because I want us to jump on a bandwagon of hate and um, reactivate the fear or the rage. There may be some rage that needs to come through, and that is totally fine. And that is part of what our work will be during our time together at the retreat. But I want to do this because I feel it's so important for us to understand now that we are coming back together in order to do the work of the priestess, the shaman, the witch, which is to alchemically transmute the old wounds for ourselves, for our lineages, for the collective, and even for our own incarnational histories. So with that, I want to quote from Barbara G. Walker's book, The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, which uh, I believe is on your reading list. And if it's not, I recommend it. Okay, so this is under her entry under Inquisition which is multiple pages long, but I'm not going to read that. I'm going to read a small section here for you. So I quote, The witch's trial was a mockery. The, the accused had none of the rights that we would perceive today as a quote-unquote trial. Inquis inquisitorial rules for a trial were as follows. So this was how it worked back then. The procedure was kept secret. 
There was no public procedures. You didn't get to go sit in and watch the trial as we can today. There was no, you know, O.J. Simpson trial on American public, on American TV all over the place back in the day. It was kept secret. Any kind of common report, accusation, or hearsay was accepted as proof of guilt. So in other words, if I was one of the inquisitors, uh, in, in, inquisitors, so I was one of the men in the town who came through to look for witches, and I heard some scuttlebutt, well, you know, Rosie said to me that Mary told her that Elena was a witch. That was sufficient to go get Elena. No, no other proof was needed. That, Elena was screwed at that point. So... Um, the accused, so let's say our gal Elena here, I'm just making up these names. Let's say Elena was accused. She would not be told of the nature of the charges she that were put against her, nor would she be allowed any kind of legal counsel. She would just be taken and hauled off to jail. Um, she would, and, and then any witnesses for the mock trial, which would eventually come about, uh, were concealed. So Elena would never even know who her accusers were. And accusers could be anyone. So in this day and age, in most places, hopefully, uh, if you have been proved to be a perjurer, or if you were a child under age, or um, in some way questionable, maybe a felon, your testimonial wouldn't count in court. But back then, during the, during the Inquisition, perjurers, children, and those who had been excommunicated from the church were totally eligible to give evidence against witches. And evidence, that's again a loose term. I would call it testimonial or accusation. No favorable evidence or character witnesses were permitted. So let's say Elena, one, it was one rumor uh, uh, three, three times removed that got Elena thrown in prison. And then everybody in the community almost comes to Elena's defense. She's not a witch. She's a good woman, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't count. It would not be considered, it's not considered in court, it's not considered admissible, nothing. It's, you know, you might as well talk to a hole in the ground or write it on the ice, as my grandmother used to say. If you were to bear good witness for Elena, it wouldn't count. And worse still than that. Anyone who spoke for an accused her uh, heretic or witch spoke on their behalf, would be arrested as an accomplice. So if Elena's mother or sister or daughter stepped up and said, "My the, Elena is not a witch, they would be hauled in as well. Torture was used always, without limit or duration or severity. Even if the accused was confessed before torture began, the torture was applied anyway in order to quote-unquote validate the confession. If the accused died under torture, the record stated that the devil broke his neck in prison. So I want to touch on torture here for a minute, and I am not going to elaborate on it. Um, sexual sadistic torture was typical. So um, there are places you can find that out. I really don't want to go into it, but I can say for sure I've seen some of the devices, and there are places in Europe where they have museums of this. Sexual sadism was the torture perpetrated by priest, church elder men against women. And what was done to these women was often the very thing they were accused of. And during their torture, uh, they were forced to confirm the names of their quote-unquote accomplices, which were, of course, suggested to them by the judges or by their torturers. So, Elena was, wasn't was Mary with you. Mary was with you under the, under, under the moon, dancing and, and having sex with the devil and his, his ice member, or his fiery hot member. And, and, and Sue was there too, wasn't she? And, and, you know, and like that. And, of course, if you've had enough torture, your mind is becomes like jello and so you then would confess to whatever they would say and then of course that would give them the opportunity to haul in these other women and just to kind of underscore this in case you were wondering at this point 
No accused woman was ever found innocent. Not in Europe. I think at, at some point there were a few that were that did escape in in the Americas, um, but in Europe, no, none were. No person was ever found innocent. No woman, or man for that matter, or child. And uh, there's one other thing I want to say here about this, is that when a woman was accused, or a man for that matter, as infrequent as that was, remember 70% were women. When a woman was accused, she would be taken in. But of course, it costs money to jail her because you got to pay for the jailer. You also had to pay for her inquisitors. And of course, they lived very well. They made very good money doing their sacred God work of torturing these women. So they needed to be paid. The jailer needed to be paid. Uh, and, and how were they paid? Well, the church took all of the property of the accused, whether she had jewelry, whether she had land, whether she had animals, you know, cows, chickens, etc. Whatever she owned was taken into possession in order to pay for her imprisonment, his, her torture. And of course, it costs money to buy the wood to burn her at the stake if she was going to be burned at the stake. So to kill her as well. She paid for her own imprisonment, torture, and murder. <sighs> Let's take a breath. A little more with this, a little more. We're getting there. So a couple other things. It's just this whole burned at the stake. I want to talk about this. Bur burning a woman at the stake, burning a witch at the stake was the most common way to, to get rid of a witch. But it wasn't the only way. There were a few places where burning at the stake was not allowed or legal or whatever. In which case they would drown them or they would hang them. There was also a very interesting practice in some places, and I'm not remembering where, but I, I want to say England. I want to say England. Uh, where if the, the accused, in order to, if she said she was innocent, they had a way of, of testing her, checking her to make sure, you know, to see. And so they say, okay, okay, you know, you, okay, Elena, you say you're innocent. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to tie this big giant rock to your waist. And then when it's nice and secure and it's big, this big heavy rock weighs as much as you or some, you know, close to your weight, we're going to throw you and the rock in this deep pond so that you sink to the bottom. Now, if you stay at the bottom and you drown, then we know your soul is saved. You weren't a witch. But if you rise to the top, you are a witch and we will hang you. <laughs> so talk about damned if you do, if dam damned if you, you don't. So now imagine for 250 years, this shit is going on in hamlets and villages and towns and cities all over Europe. 70% of those accused were female, women and young, you know, young or young adult girls, let's say. And imagine what that must have felt like to live during that time. The sheer terror. The sheer terror. Because even though many people probably didn't know all the tortures, you could imagine over 50, 60, 70, 80 years, people started to know about these horrible tortures, the sadism that was going on. So when the inquisitor came to, inquisitors came to your town, can you imagine how scary it would be to have any connections with any women at all? This is why I say this was the death blow. This was the death blow to sisterhood. And there's one other thing I want to say about this. This is, again, a little aside, like a kind of a side note. Do you know that there's this term for specifically for gay men called faggot? And when we look up this, this term for the word faggot, the word really literally means a, 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 bunch of wood a bunch of wood sticks. So how the hell does a bunch of wood sticks associate with gay men? Because in some areas, gay men were used, if they didn't have wood, to start the fires to burn the witches at the stake. They would throw gay men on those, those pyres of burning flames. So, yeah, again, it wasn't, it wasn't just when, women, although it was mostly women, you know, 70% women. But if you were a gay man, it wasn't like you were any much safer, really. So, 
so this period of time, this, this Inquisition, as I said, it was done during the, primarily during the Renaissance period. It was perpetrated by both Catholics and Protestants. It happened in Europe with a very small coda, a very small period of time in the New World in the 1700s. It was the woman's holocaust. And so again, let's just take a breath here. This division, this, this terror, this terror that women experienced, we are now coming to the place where we're really stepping in to heal this at a very deep level at an alchemical level, at a level where we're transmuting for the collective, transmuting also for our lineages. Because many of us, if not most of us, if not all of us, somehow, somewhere, somewhen carry this in our, either our cellular level lineage field or our energetic field. And so these, these things that I've shared here, the, the history, the legacy of history, and we've got, we've touched on Asia, we've touched, you know, on the Far East and China, and Chinese foot binding, we've touched on female clitoridectomy, which still happens in some countries and some uh, uh, tribes and cultures today, and we touched on the European uh, witch burning or inquisition. We see the way a dominator culture which not only um, devalues the feminine, but actually violently denigrates it, we see just the kind of sadism, just the kind of hatred, just the kind of traumatization and d divisiveness that this can create. And it's kind of like, you know, when, when the psyche is so traumatized, it fractures. It literally fractures. So is it any wonder that after generations of these traumas, that we have many women who are dealing with um, narcissism or bipolar or um, um, what's that other one? Borderline personality disorder. Is it any wonder that we see women stabbing each other in the back over, uh, over men? I mean, think about that for a minute. What does that mean? Is it any wonder that we could imagine for even a moment that in prehistory, pre-his story, some brutish caveman could drag a woman by the hair, take her into a cave and rape her. And I, and I love to ask this question, like, really think about that for a minute. What is wrong with that picture? Why is it absolutely impossible in prehistory for some brutish caveman to drag a woman off by her hair into a cave to rape her? Let's give that a breath in a moment and see if it arises for you. Because, here's the answer, before our bonds of sisterhood, motherhood, daughterhood were destroyed in patriarchy, do you imagine for a moment that any woman would allow her sister, daughter, mother to be dragged off by the hair by one brutish man? We would be all over his ass, wouldn't we? So just sit with that, sit with that image. I invite you to just feel into that and um, to kind of begin to bring this up a little bit. I, I, again, I share this because I want us to go deep into the awareness of what legacy we are, we have come into this incarnation with and what we as the women of empowerment, as the healers, teachers, leaders, mentors, priestesses, and witches, have come to transmute. We are not here to reactivate this, put our pussy hats on and march in the streets with hate. That will not serve. Although I do, I am rather fond of the pussy hats. I think they're quite lovely and I love anything to do with pussy power. But that is not what this is about. This is about us really connecting with this energy, understanding it, understanding the context of history that has brought us to where we are so that we could look with the courage of the fierce feminine warrior and face this shadow material so that we can begin to transmute it alchemically through our bodies. And part of the work we do in the retreats is the processes that help facilitate and support this kind of transmutation work. 
And so, sisters, with this, I'm going to bring this to a close now. There's so much more I could share on this. I invite your comments, feedback, insights, um, requests for anything else that needs to be elaborated or touched on. I'm happy to receive your requests so that I could be sure that the teaching and the processes during our retreats are actually serving you. So please, um, please share what your experience is going through this and what other questions you may have. Okay, with that, I am going to close this for now and with a deep bow of respect and appreciation for you, for all you've ever been through and all you are willing to stand up, face, own, and claim as an empowered feminine leader, I thank you. And I look so very forward to circling with you during the retreat. Until soon, many, many blessings and much love.